Hey guys, Constance here. Welcome back to the greenhouse. So I'm actually out here today. I'm getting ready to start working on staining the floor. Um, I cannot believe how much feedback I got about my photo, my just little snapshot of the painted greenhouse that I posted on Instagram and shared it over to Facebook uh, yesterday. Um, lots of lots of great feedback just as a, a recap I want to remind everyone while I have built a lot of stuff chicken coops and sheds and barns and all that stuff here I did not build this greenhouse this greenhouse was built by Yoder's Woodworks in Falkville Alabama and they delivered it here for me and all of that so they did all the hard work for me I'm doing the fun work I'm doing the making it my own work. Um, I painted all of the walls, all of the countertops and everything. It's an outdoor kind of weatherproofing, weather safe um, sort of paint. And I use that kind of paint because, you know, these countertops, there's going to be a lot of dirt, there's going to be a lot of water. And so I just wanted to try and protect the wood as much as possible. Even though it is treated lumber that they used to build these, I still wanted to add that extra layer uh, of protection. Now, of course, over time, I'm sure these beautiful green, uh, minty green uh, counters will get stained, but it's a greenhouse. Um, it doesn't matter to me that it'll get stained. It's just part of the process, but the mint green walls I feel are cheerful and just calming and uh, officially the color is honeyed mint and that was a I think it was a Sherman Williams color or something like that I'll I'll put the details uh, in a note underneath this video of exactly what um, color variation it was and everything so I just got done sweeping the floor and I'm going to coat it with this Valspar One Coat Exterior Stain and Sealer. It's transparent so you can see the wood grain and everything through it, but it is a cedar, cedar color. And so that this is what I'm going to use on the floor. Again, it's treated lumber, you know, pressure treated and all that, but um, I want to add a little bit of extra protection since there, again, will be water and dirt and everything else in here. So, I'm gonna get started. Um, I'm gonna cut in first by hand with a brush. And once I get all of the edges cut in around the counter legs, then I will go back and use this um, long-handled one for all of the surfaces in between. And then I'm sure I'll have to go back and touch up like the cracks, the seams of the boards, the floorboards, um, but this should get most of it done. And it's a little cool and breezy today, which is good. Um, so I'm just going to do the one coat today and then just let it chill. Um, I've got all the windows open, I've got the door open, and I've got a fan over there in the window and just kind of helping with the breeze.
Alrighty, so it is now late afternoon, uh, early evening, and the floor is pretty much dried. Um, but even though the stain that I was using said it's a one coat coverage sort of stain, I am going to go ahead and do two coats because I'll show you here. It's not it's not very evenly coated. Um, you can see right here where as I was working my way this way and then worked my way out through the middle where I kind of overlapped that area twice and so it's a little bit darker. So I will do another coat um, on the floor. I'm not going to do it right away. Uh, I am going to wait until it's a little bit cooler out or at the very least until I can get out here really early in the morning to do it. Um, because even though it was overcast today and it was breezy and I had the fan going, uh, it was hot. It was very hot in here. So uh, I was like anxious to get done <laughs> with this first coat. But let me show you what else I picked up the other day. Um, of course, I've got a fan for in here which I'll figure out where I want that to sit um, later on but I picked up this package of lighting it says it's commercial grade which should mean that it's gonna last a long time hopefully um, but it's LED and it is string lights and it's a 18 light set I picked this up at my local Lowe's and it is 48 feet long, this entire thing. So what I'm wanting to do is I want lights to go down the center and then I'll go all the way around the greenhouse as much as I can. I won't be able to go 100% all the way around and across the peak, but it'll be pretty close and I think it'll be enough to um, make it look good. The other thing I added was this little hook right here. Um, my son actually picked this up and uh, gave this to me. I'm going to paint the screws that I put it in with to kind of match or at least, you know, paint them black or something to kind of camouflage that a little bit. I love these um, star bit screws. I use them for everything just about. <laughs> so I've got that hook there. And then over here on this side, I purchased this um, hook, I guess you could say, from a blacksmith years ago at an event. And I've had it all this time, I just didn't know what to do with it, and it's just been in storage ever since I bought it. Um, I do need to come out here and get a shorter screw because there's a knot in this wood and this screw would not go in all the way. So I, I think this is probably like a three inch or two and a half inch screw. So I will pull this one out and put a shorter one in there. I just didn't have another one out here with me when I was putting this in last night. Um, got some dog hair. I'm telling you this has been tucked underneath a, a shelving unit for a couple of years, literally gathering dust <laughs> and cobwebs. So I finally have a place to put this really cool hook. And so I can hang um, jackets out here when I come out here, or I can hang tools from it, or pretty much whatever I want to, because that is a nice, sturdy hook. So I wasn't sure if I would actually end up liking the cedar floor color, um, but I think it actually is turning out great. I think that sort of copper color contrasting with the green uh, wood in here looks pretty nice. And then of course the bright green outside from the grasses. So I think it's lovely. And if you can hear that sound, it is starting to rain. We've got a, we've actually got a storm system rolling in. <laughs> Speaking of which, it just thundered. You can probably tell from the color of the sky out there. So I mentioned in a recent video 
where I was talking about hatching out some more Icelandic eggs. And it was so funny because right around the time I was thinking about doing that, uh, Mr. Smith actually mentioned it too. And, and if Mr. Smith mentions that maybe we should hatch some eggs, I am not going to hesitate. I am going to jump on that. And so we immediately started collecting uh, the Icelandic eggs, setting them aside away from the rest of the eggs. And I currently have 11, I think it was 11 Icelandic eggs in the incubator. And, you know, it was funny. We were talking about it. You know, we hatched out the Icelandics back in... Oh gosh, when was that? October, I think it was, of last year. And, you know, we ended up, we ended up with eight that thrived and made it. And it was four hens and four roosters, which is not a good, not a good ratio. You don't want that many uh, roosters. And so we, we kind of debated on which one we wanted to keep. And ultimately we kept the kind of auburn red colored one. Uh, he's got some crazy eyes on him and I actually named him Yosemite Sam because he's a redhead and he's a little crazy eyed. <laughs> and so um, that's his name, Yosemite Sam. And you know, we were talking about it. I said, you know, it would really stink if we kept one Icelandic rooster and that one Icelandic rooster wasn't fertile. And, you know, the crazy thing is I said that to my son and Mr. Smith had actually said the exact same thing to him. That would really stink if we kept the wrong rooster. So the Icelandic eggs have been in the incubator for a couple of days. I'm going to let them go probably four or five days and then I will candle them, look for signs of growth in there. Um, the first thing that you see is veins. You will actually see veins beginning to grow inside the shell. And so that is your first evidence that they are fertile and that something is happening. And so I'm, you know, fingers crossed that in a couple of days when I do that, we have a, a good sign. Because, you know, we've got that little... Um, coop out in the big garden the black-tailed white japanese bantams and actually in a couple of weeks they're going to be able to go out into uh, the garden right now i keep them in their enclosure while the garden is young and the plants are delicate and then once it's established i let them out and they can free roam in the garden um, it they fertilize they eat bugs and they're so little they're really not going to hurt anything but um, until I get my little baby melon plants that I have restarted in there and established, um, those, will, those will be the ones that we're waiting on. But the reason I bring them up is because, you know, we have that little flock. It's three little hens and one little rooster named Rupert. And Rupert is not fertile. We have repeatedly um, tried to incubate eggs from that little flock. Um, they've gone broody. The, those hens go broody all the time, all the time. And, you know, we'll let them sit on the eggs for a little while and then we'll test them. And there has never been a single fertile egg coming out of that little flock, which kind of stinks. And so that makes us a little mm, nervous, um, that we only have the one rooster. I think ultimately, I guess worst case scenario, if we do end up not having a fertile rooster, uh, I may just go ahead and order some more Icelandic eggs in the mail and uh, try again and add to the flock that way. So we'll just have to see. We're playing it by ear. But speaking of eggs, there was something else that happened this week. Uh, actually, it was last weekend. I, I just forgot to mention it until just now. Um, if you saw it on Instagram, you are already in on this. But I went out on Saturday morning. I was going to sit down in my rocking chair that's on the front porch 
well, I did sit down on my rocking chair on the front porch and I was sitting there for a few minutes when I felt something tickling my arm and I looked down on my arm and it was a baby praying mantis about the size of a mosquito, freshly hatched, teeny tiny. And I looked up and on the arm was an entire row of baby praying mantises. And I was like, oh my goodness. So I jumped up because I realized, you know, on my rocking chair, I have a cushion and on the back of the cushion, there's been a praying mantis egg case all winter long. And it was in a spot where if you sit down on the cushion, you're not going to harm it in any way. Here comes the rain. All right, there is a lull. So let me finish this story real quick before it starts again. I realized that that egg case on the back of my rocking chair cushion had hatched. And so I jumped up and I got a little video clip of some of these praying mantis babies. And then I proceeded to catch as many of them as I could and I put them out in my garden, all in all different places all over the garden. Um, praying mantises, if they get big enough, they will actually try to um, catch hummingbirds. You know, we do have hummingbirds that come around. It's a very rare thing for that to happen, but they will. Uh, last year, I actually removed a praying mantis from the hummingbird feeder multiple times before it finally gave up and went somewhere else. Um, but praying mantises are your, the gardener's best friend because they are a wonderful, wonderful beneficial bug. And you can actually order praying mantis cases off the internet from Arbicore Organics and other places um, to help them, uh, to put them in your garden. And with that, because it is fixing to the pour, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up this video for today. Thanks for hanging out with me here in the greenhouse. I will talk to y'all next time.